All right, folks, we're going to get rolling here. If you want to take your seats. Thanks very, very much for being here. We appreciate it an awful lot. My name is Andy Larson. I am a local food systems and small farms educator for U of I Extension. I'm based up in Ogle County, northwestern Illinois. I'm also, uh, since Rick Weinzerl's retirement earlier this summer, myself and Dr. Laura Christensen are the new Illinois SARE co-coordinators with our project manager, Mary Hosier, right behind us. So we are kind of your uh, local faces of SARE here in Illinois, both for the central part of the state, Laura's located here on campus and out in the field. I'm up in an extension office in Northern Illinois. Um, very, very glad to have you. Very glad to see some interest in SARE. I'm just going to make a couple of housekeeping announcements. First and foremost, we have some useful literature describing SARE, who we are and what we do. One of the things that the folks in the room are probably most interested in is this little white sheet with four different uh, grant proposals that are currently open and closing sometime between October 20th and December 8th, depending on which one you want to apply to. Uh, so there are four different funding opportunities that are out there right now. So please be aware of those and uh, be aware of those dates because, boy, do they sneak up on you fast. Um, housekeeping. I think most everybody's from here on campus. You probably know where the restrooms are and everything. Um, if you didn't sign the sheet when you were going through to get your pizza, please do that at some point over the course of the day today uh, in order for us to give uh, uh, an accurate number of who we fed so that the the feds don't worry about us, you know, getting our receipts paid and things like that. Um, last but not least, I want to introduce the people that are going to be here giving the bulk of the presentation today. These are our regional SAIR staff. Uh, they are divided between University of Minnesota and a couple universities in Missouri. These are the folks that are kind of the decision makers, the grant coordinators, the, the people who are in uh, the leadership that we answer to. Uh, so Rob Meyer, Dr. Rob Myers, Dr. Beth Nelson, Dr. Beth Nelson, and Joan Benjamin are all going to be sort of tag teaming on this presentation. Uh, they will give a little bit more detailed introduction of themselves. Uh, this is not a formal thing. If you need more pizza, get up and get it. Do whatever you got to do. Um, and we'd really love some back and forth if you have questions about uh, what makes a good grant proposal, details about SARE, anything else like that, please do go ahead and ask us. Um, without further ado, I'll let our bosses come up. <laughs> so I'll say a little bit more about who the real decision makers are uh, in the SARE grant program. but. Um, as Andy said, thank you for coming today. It's a beautiful day. I know it's supposed to rain tomorrow, so some of you probably have things you need to get done in the field. We appreciate you being here. This is a quick presentation. We do a very brief overview. We have a lot of information on our website as well. Um, this will take 25 minutes or so, and, um, and then we will go back uh, and answer any questions that you have. So, and I understand we are also broadcasting. So when you ask questions, uh, we'll be repeating them up here in front, or Andy will be repeating them for, um, so that the people who are Skyping in can hear as well. So I'm going to start off today, and I am Beth Nelson, and I am at the University of Minnesota uh, in St. Paul. So University of Minnesota hosts the North Central Region SARE, SARE program. Uh, but we also are stationed in other areas. As Andy said, we're tag teaming and my colleagues are stationed in other areas, um, both in Missouri, but in different institutions and they'll introduce themselves. Um, so I just wanna give you a, a brief overview about what SARE is. This is our mission statement. SARE provides grants and outreach to advance sustainable innovations to the whole of American agriculture. So it's a very broad mission and we cover a lot of areas as you'll see later in the presentation. So we are almost 30 years old. We're gonna have a 30th um, anniversary conference coming up here in about a year and a half. Uh, we were started in 1988 and the idea was this would be a different kind of grant program and we like to think that it really is. So it is decentralized. We have four different regions um, that decide what grants will happen, what policies will happen in that region. Um, and we'll show a map of that later. 
We do science-based research, but it's also practical problem-solving research. So these are not basic research projects that are funded through the SARE program. They're applied uh, projects that are addressing a, a problem, usually in, on a farmer's field or, or dealing with some aspect of agriculture out in the, out in the real world. Grassroots, and that gets back to what I said about who the real decision makers are. So we are governed by an administrative council that is made up of farmers and ranchers, researchers, some uh, government personnel. They are the ones who actually make the decisions about what grants are funded. We use review panels that also seek to use peers. Um, so farmers serve on all of our uh, panels to review grants and help to make the recommendations to our administrative council who, also, who actually make the funding decisions. Um, we, are, we do also do outreach and we will talk a little bit about that as well. So that grassroots aspect of having farmers engaged and then also insisting that all projects, even research and education projects, also include some form of outreach. So the SARE model, again, I mentioned that we have the four regional councils and those councils set the priorities and, and uh, approve the different grants that are funded. We do have a branch, a national branch called SARE Outreach that does some work to develop books um, and other types of bulletins and educational materials that we'll talk about a little bit more that are based on the results from those projects. We are funded by USDA NEFA, that's our source of funding. Um, and there is written into our enabling language, our legislative language, uh, things that make us partner with other USDA agencies. So we do that both officially and unofficially. We do have NRCS on our administrative councils. Um, we have some other groups like the Soil Survey Group or, and ARS are on our administrative councils. And then this, if you have ever looked at the information for SARE grants, you know that we talk about sustainability and the three aspects of sustainability, sometimes the legs of the stool, however you describe it. Um, this idea that you are looking at a systems project that looks at profit over the long term, stewardship of our lands, uh, our nation's land and water, and then quality of life for farmers and ranchers and society as a whole. So we're looking at environment, economics, and social aspects. And we always say that when you're applying for a grant, even if you're focused on one aspect of the grant, that you at least consider and mention in your application how you are addressing the other areas. That's another focal thing about SARE. I think with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rob. Thanks, Beth. Well, hello everyone, I'm Rob Myers and uh, I work at the University of Missouri as an agronomist, but spend my time these days working with the uh, North Central Sustainable Ag Research and Education Program, particularly on the extension side of our funding. Uh, Sarah has uh, traditionally received two lines of funding from Congress, one for research and education, which Dr. Nelson oversees, and, and one for extension. Lately, they've kind of merged those together, but we continue to have extension as a very strong part of our program and a big part of this is working with extension professionals all across states like Illinois. So we work not only with folks on campus but also the extension staff that are out in county offices across the uh, region. One thing that's really important to know with SARE is that we fund a very wide range of topics. I sometimes run into people who have just heard a little bit about SARE and they'll assume one of two things. Either that you have to have a really broad proposal on sustainable ag, or maybe that SARE is just organic ag. We were doing this seminar a couple of years ago at another university, and, and someone came up to me and said, well, gee, I thought SARE was only funding organic ag, and that's really not the case. Organic is maybe 10% of our portfolio, but you can see the wide range of, of topics, and there are many others that we fund. So typically, the proposals we get are fairly focused. They may be just on soil quality, just on pollinators, uh, they may be on water quality in particular, maybe they're focused on uh, rotational grazing management. And so uh, just kind of keep that in mind as you're thinking about a proposal, not unlike what you might see with, with NIFA, other programs they have such as AFRI. The key difference I would say is not so much the topics, but that we really want to have that farmer involvement as Dr. Nelson mentioned. So that's really one way that we distinguish our grants from others. 
And we have about 25 million nationally that goes to these many different topic areas. As Beth mentioned, we are funded through four regions of the US. So in the gold region or the north central region, the 12 state area, uh, we uh, uh, fund programs on six different topic areas and we're gonna walk you through those. So far, we've funded over 4,000 projects nationwide. So Sarah has, we feel, had a pretty big impact. These six different uh, program areas differ a bit from region to region. So one thing I'd mention, we get a question sometimes, let's say you're working with somebody, oh, in Kentucky, and uh, you're trying to look at that and you say, well, Kentucky's down in that red area, how do I deal with that? It's very simple. If uh, you're working with a colleague in Kentucky or one of the other states outside our region, uh, we just simply go by which region has the biggest part of the project. So if that's here in Illinois, then you'd submit in the North Central region. If you're really gonna be kind of playing uh, second fiddle to some folks in another state, uh, then they'd apply through their region. But certainly we do have projects that cross state lines. Just to kind of look at what we've done in Illinois, uh, these pie charts give you a couple different ways of looking at the projects that have been funded. So the one on the left is by the number of projects that have been funded. You can see the biggest is our farmer rancher grants. We've had 56 of those in Illinois. So think about that for a minute. There's over 50 farmers in the state of Illinois that have done projects typically research oriented on their farms with funding from this program. So that's a pool of people out there that some of you can maybe uh, collaborate with because these farmers, of course, have great ideas for what would be helpful to them. I know we have a number of grad students in the room and I would point out we've had 17 graduate student projects so far in Illinois and we would definitely welcome more graduate student proposals from the state going forward. The one area that we'd probably like to see uh, an increase in proposals from Illinois is in the research and education area. We've, we've had some coming in, but frankly, Illinois hasn't quite had as many of these projects as some other states. So we'll talk to you about some of the individual programs. You can kind of see the dollar amounts here. Because the research and education program is our biggest program, that's the one that's gotten the most money. But even the farmer rancher grant uh, with those 56 projects, that's added up to some substantial funding. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to Beth to talk about some of the specific programs we have. I was just going to add to to what Rob said. Um, we do have a list that does list all the projects that have been funded. I think, is that over on the table? Okay. So you can flip through that and see some of the projects. One of the things we're doing this week, besides being here and doing the seminar today, is meeting with projects both on campus but around the state as well. So we've been able to visit some of the farmer rancher grant projects that are going on. And they're just really interesting work going on in Illinois. So I'm going to give you a very quick overview about the research and education grant program. So this is our largest grant program up to, up to $200,000. You can do those for a duration of three years. They can be either research or education demonstration projects. And again, if they, it is a research project, we still insist on you doing extension with that or doing doing outreach work with that. That's so it may be presenting at a seminar at a farmers gather one of the farmer meetings uh, during the winter or something like that. But we do insist on outreach with every research project. But you can just do an education or demonstration project as well in this in this grant program. The grants do primarily go to organizations, but they can go to uh, NGO, so nonprofit organizations or non-government organizations, as well as uh, colleges and universities. Obviously, a lot of them go to our land grants, but if you're collaborating with other colleges or universities, they are also eligible to apply for these. We fund about 10 grants per year, and this is the this is the bad news part. So we get about 170 pre-proposals. We do use a pre-proposal process um, to try to winnow things down. We invite about 30 proposals. We have funding for 10. Um, so it is a very competitive pro process. So uh, one thing I would say, if you're someone who has applied um, and not been funded, that it is not a disadvantage to apply again if you've addressed the comments that you've gotten. Our reviewers like to see that, and that's often a comment they'll make is that, well, we made these suggestions last year and they've really incorporated those ideas. So I would encourage you to apply again if you've, if you've had one and it makes sense to address those comments and to reapply. 
I do coordinate uh, the research and education grant program. My contact information is at the end. It's also on the end of our, it's also our contact information is in all of our call for proposals. We welcome your questions. You, you can call and discuss an idea with us, but we always do ask that you talk to your state coordinators, partly just because they know this, you know, the, the context you're working in, I guess. And also they can connect you with farmers if you're not working with other farmers and want to be connected. I mentioned it's a pre-proposal process. The call for pre-proposals is out right now. They are due October 20th, 2016. One of the ways we've tried to address this problem of uh, having so many come in and having to choose amongst them is to try to limit the amount of time you have to take to prepare a pre-proposal. So there is no longer a budget required. We just ask you for um, a range that you're going to spend. Uh, it's a pretty simple pre-proposal now, maybe two or three pages. The, if you applied two or three years ago, you were basically filling out almost a proposal to apply when you did your pre-proposal. Much shorter now, so I encourage you to look at the call. Uh, that should give us a way for you not to invest too much time to see if that concept fits with what Sarah is looking at that year. Uh, the, so the pre-proposals are due October 20th. Full proposals, uh, you'll be invited. The decisions are made in January that we let you know in early February. Full proposals are due in April. And then the funding decision is made in July with the funds available October 1st. So that would be October 1st of 2017. So it's kind of a long lead time because of the pre-proposal process. And again, in all of our grants, but especially in the research and education grant program, it's important that you have farmers involved in the program. And we get some really great proposals. And the com one comment the reviewers make is, I don't see how farmers are engaged in this project. So if you're looking at a project, if you can pull farmers together to advise you about the project, to help you set up the research, to help you uh, to do research in their fields, um, if you did a survey that indicated this is information that farmers want, include that in your pre-proposal. Those are things that are that weigh heavily in your favor in, in all of SARE grant projects. Another grant program that I manage is the Graduate Student Grant Program. Uh, and as Rob said, we've had a number of successful ones here at Illinois. We just met with a couple of them this morning. So one of the best ways to write a grant, I think, is to talk to someone who's successfully gotten a grant. So uh, we met with Jim Miller and Jamie Kuhn this morning. And Scott, I saw earlier. So um, and Jamie has a current SARE grant that really exemplifies this idea of addressing social environmental, and a little bit economic um, aspects as well. Uh, so you could talk to Jamie about that. Uh, those grants are small. They're up only for up to $12,000. So what we say is they're obviously not going to fund a graduate student for three years, but they will fund an aspect of their project. Perhaps it is the outreach aspect of their project, or it's some kind of an aspect of their, their thesis project. Those proposals, that's a spring proposal process. So that call comes out in February and they are due in April, mid-April, um, with the funds available September 1st of 2017, so a much shorter turnaround time. We fund about 15 to 17 of those. We get 40 to 50 proposals, so that's a much better success rate. So that's a, a good place to have your uh, students start. Our intention with the with the program is beyond just getting the research results, we are training future researchers. We hope to be giving them an experience of writing and managing a grant. So we do ask the graduate students do, you know, a lot of the grant management part of the work, even though the faculty advisor will probably be listed as the, the PI by the by University of Illinois. And I coordinate that program as well. And this is just to talk a little bit about the impact of, of graduate students um, working not just in, through the graduate student grant program, but a lot of research and education grant programs, a good part of the funding goes to support a graduate student to work on the project. That is viewed favorably also by reviewers because they feel like in addition to getting the information uh, or the research results, 
we're also training future researchers. Um, and up to 50% of those students co-author scholarly papers. And I think with that, we'll move on to the partnership grant program which, that Rob is gonna talk about. Okay, so you've heard about two of our grant programs so far, and I wanna just mention that only one of them has a pre-proposal process, which is our biggest one, the research and education. The rest uh, have varying lengths of materials and different due dates, so just kind of keep that in mind as we're going through these. So the partnership grant program is kind of a new one for us, and if you or one of your colleagues wants to do a little bit smaller project, but one that's fairly easy to apply to, this is a good one to look at. These are up to $30,000, and we kind of tried to make these as flexible as possible. So this could be for a research-specific project, it could be for something that's just demonstration-oriented, it can be just education, or it could even be a marketing type project. Now these are ones that we intend to go primarily to support farmers doing something new among a small group of farmers. We ask that three or more farmers be involved. And most typically these would be perhaps on-farm demonstration research projects. Maybe they're doing strip trials with a new agronomic practice or a new grazing system, but it definitely can be other aspects of this like education and marketing. We ask that an ag professional lead these projects. That ag professional could be any of you in this room, or it could be a private sector person. So maybe you work with a crop consultant or livestock consultant. They could lead the project. It can be a farmer leading the project if they um, have some particular expertise in that topic area. But typically this ag professional, such as one of you, would work with, like I said, a group of three or more farmers, and this would be a two-year project uh, where, again, you could uh, try something collectively on those three farms or uh, even a larger group of farms. So again, designed to be very flexible. Our professional development uh, grant program is one that's been around for quite a while. This is our project that's more on the extension side of things or really training-oriented. Uh, these are grants to help ag professionals, and that would be many of you, uh, that would also go out then and train other agriculture professionals, other ag educators in particular. So those ag educators could be extension staff, they could be people from NRCS or other federal agencies or even state agencies. And lately we've been doing a lot of uh, nonprofit projects in this area. So you could work collectively to do educators across multiple organizations. But it's not really, in this particular program, intended to go out and, and educate farmers. This is more a train-the-trainer type of thing. So the competitive grants that we have under this funding, and then I'll talk about some state funding, the competitive grants will be due next April, and those are $75,000 per project, and the funds would be available next fall. These have funded uh, workshops, uh, such as on cover crops or soil health or grazing management systems. They funded water quality projects, IPM. Uh, they can do webinars, they can do videos, uh, curriculum materials, kind of a variety of programs aimed at train the trainer. And then this bottom part down here on state activities, this is a little different. What we've been talking to you about so far are regional competitive grants, but we also give some money directly to each state. So uh, Illinois gets $100,000 from SARE every other year, and that pays for a little bit of Andy and Laura's time as your co-coordinators in the states, but it also pays for some workshops, webinars, and other mini grants. So if you have a little project, you just have a little thing you want to get started, and you need maybe a thousand, two thousand, three thousand dollars, talk to Laura or Andy about that, and they might be able to help you out. That does need to be something that's education or professional development oriented, so it's not to do a small research project. I need to emphasize that. These are to, again, fit into our train the trainer type programs, but it can involve farmers uh, to some extent. Or we also have money through that program to do travel scholarships. So let's say you wanted to go out and learn a new uh, topic related to water quality or livestock systems, you could get some assistance from Andy and Laura to go out and uh, go to an event in another state, or it could even be here in Illinois. So just kind of a variety of of opportunities there. And, and Andy and Laura will say a little bit more to you, I think, later about uh, some of those opportunities. So we wanted to finish up with our two other grant programs. So I'll bring up Joan Benjamin to talk about those last two grants. 
Hello, I'm Joan Benjamin. I coordinate our Farmer Rancher Grant Program. I'm housed at Lincoln University, which is one of our two 1890 schools in the North Central region that's in Jefferson City, Missouri. The Farmer Rancher Grant's a really unique program, and it's one that makes our SARE program stand out because it's meant for farmers and ranchers to apply and solve a problem on the farm or ranch using their own ideas, and they're using sustainable agriculture practices. The object is to try and share that information with others so other farmers and ranchers can benefit from it. The way we define a farmer for this program is a simple dictionary definition. It's someone who raises crops or livestock, especially as a business. And the reason we use that broad definition is because we want it to be wide open. So that could include urban agriculture, could be field crops, could be agroforestry, could be aquaculture. So it's just as wide open as we can make it. And they might be looking at a production problem, marketing problems, labor issues, it's it, all kinds of topics that they can look at. We have three options. There's one individual option where a single farmer can apply for up to $7,500 to carry out one of these projects. We have team of two options for two farmers who are working together. They have to be from separate operations and they can ask for up to 15,000. And then there's a group option for three or more farmers who are working together. Again, they need to be from separate operations and they can ask for up to $22,500. This program is open right now. The applications are due December 8th and the decisions are made in February with funding available in March of next year. They are encouraged to partner with universities, uh, um, extension people, you know, we, we encourage them to, but they're not required to partner with others. As I mentioned, outreach is critical and it's something that we're really trying to encourage people to get out and whether it's through workshops, through field days, through social media, websites, whatever method works particularly well for that project or several different types to try and get that information into the hands of other people who can also use it. Another grant program I want to tell you about is I also coordinate our Youth Educator Grant Program. These are very small grants of just up to $2,000, but they're to teach young people about sustainable agriculture. Not only what it is, but also to see it as a viable career option. And we want them to help their parents see it in that light too. So hands-on activities are really encouraged. You might have FFA or 4-H be involved in this, but it's also wide open. Homeschoolers could apply. Our a definition of educator is really anyone who is educating young people about sustainable agriculture. So it could also include farmers or ranchers, other students. These are also open right now. The due date is November 10th. We fund about 10 of these projects a year. With the farmer rancher grants, we fund about 40 of those a year. So they're fairly good chances for people to get these grants. And the other thing about them is that they're simple if you've never applied for a grant before or if you know a farmer or rancher or educator who wants to apply, these are not like grants.gov. These are grants that are you can look at, read, and fill out yourself, and that's what we encourage people to do. As I mentioned, outreach is a huge part of our program because the point is to share this information with others. And so here are some of the impacts over the years of the grant program that show you just through all of these grants the kinds of results people have had. And then finally, I wanted to talk to you about the outreach efforts that we have that come from our national office, which is to produce publications. And we have books, bulletins. There's all kinds of online materials available to you. We have flash drives that have all of our books and bulletins on them that you can get. Everything that we have is available for free online. You can download our books, our bulletins. If you want to buy those, the, the bulletins are free. The books have a small charge, you know, just to help pay for the expense of publishing them. But we have brochures up here that say no more, and they list the books and bulletins that are out there. A lot of these feature the information that was produced through the grant projects. So that is a way to help get this grant information out to people. One of the most popular ones is this managing cover crops profitably. If that's a topic of interest to you, it's a huge resource for people who are working with cover crops. But we have books and bulletins and all kinds of issues. And then we have a lot of social media information available now. Um, Marie, do you want to mention any of the social media resources that we have? 
the North Central Region Center Program is uh, active on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, we also have the national office, and they have Facebook and Twitter accounts as well. And Illinois Center is on Facebook doing Sarah uh, posts about stuff that's going on specifically in Illinois. So kind of all of the social media. That's your interest. So lots of options. I hope you go to our website, which is northcentralsare.org, or our national website, which is just sare.org, and you can click on project reports, look at project reports from across the country, see what people are doing. It's a really good way to prepare for a grant project, go out and see what's already been done on that topic, so you can take that and build on it. And um, another thing that I wanted to mention to you is, Another way you can get involved with SARE in addition to grant projects is serving on one of our review committees. And so, for instance, on the Farmer Rancher Grant Review Committee, we have a team of 20, uh, 24 farmers, mostly farmers and ranchers, who get together and review the grant proposals. So really looking for practical information. We have other review teams, our technical committee that reviews the research and education grants. So sometime you may be tapped and say, hey, would you like to be a part of this? And it's a really good opportunity not only to see that behind the scenes, how the grant process works, but get more familiar with SARE grant projects. So at this point, if you have any questions, OK, Marie has an announcement. I have here, this is um, a sign up sheet, which will allow you to get more information about any of the grant programs that you're interested in. Um, you know, share this contact information with anyone else. This is strictly to be able to communicate with you about areas of interest to you. So, if you want to fill it out um, and then check the boxes that are of interest to you, then we'll send you emails letting you know when the calls are out um, and information of that nature. Um, so, I will just pass this around if you're interested in receiving uh, emails and contact from us. Just sign up. So just in closing, to reemphasize a couple of things, you can tell probably by the different speakers that we've had today that this program, SARE, is very much um, on the ground, impact oriented for farmers. We want a, a need that a farmer has identified and we want the results of your research to go back out to the people who can truly benefit from it. So uh, please do keep that in mind when you're planning your projects. Secondly, another thing they mentioned is that we do have a few bucks lying around here and there in our state budget to help people sort of get some momentum going. So if you're looking for a start to a SARE grant, but you're not quite sure you'd be competitive in the um, broader order applicant pool yet, give us a holler and maybe we can kind of help you get your wheels under you first. Also, uh, Laura and I are also available on the regular for questions and feedback regarding grant applications that you guys are in the process of constructing. So consider us a local resource, her right here in Turner Hall, uh, me out in the field, very accessible via all the communications through through campus. So uh, please do uh, get in touch with us. If you're looking for Illinois specific stuff, in addition to uh, some of the funds that we have for PDP, the um, extension and outreach component of it, we do have some mini grants for travel. If you're trying to get to a conference, do some education related to sustainable agriculture, we have some of that. We have our very own Illinois SARE website that Mary manages. IllinoisSARE.org. It's got a fabulous calendar of all of the uh, sustainable ag and alternative ag events that are going on in the state. It has the applications that you need for uh, doing our travel grants. They're very simple. We get notified immediately when those mini grant applications come in and you will get a response from us within the course of um, 10 business days. So that's a, a very quick turnaround. You don't have to think necessarily a year in advance. And graduate students can apply for our travel scholarships too. Graduate students, yeah. Travel scholarships are a good opportunity for you guys to start doing the presentations that you need to have on your Vita anyway. So we have the IllinoisAir.org. I'm going to put up the Illinois Air Facebook page. There's an Illinois Air Twitter account. However it is that you guys want to communicate with us, please feel free to do so uh, early and often. I'm going to bring our speakers back up to answer any questions you might have and remind them to go ahead and repeat the questions that they hear just for the purposes of the recording. And the other thing we wanted to mention to you is if you have questions about any of our grant programs, we are there to answer them. So feel free to call us, email us. We're glad to answer any questions you have. I also want to give out Ace's Office of Research, um, a debt of gratitude for helping us advertise the Illinois Air Seminar. 
for getting all of you here today. So with that, do you have questions? That's clear, huh? <laughs> oh, here's one right here. Go ahead. Uh, Lassa, I have a question for you. I think um, I, I think some of I checked the, the previous uh, funding projects uh, through the research and the education program. I, I, I find that there are uh, a few uh, a few teams that continuously get funded. It, it seems like that, and uh, there are some new teams that uh, only kind of starting to get funded. Uh, so I'm curious that uh, every year when you select ten proposals, how many will come from you know the some legacy teams uh, that previously has been chosen by Estonia and we want to continue funding and uh, how many are like brand new teams? So the question is, um, in the SARE r &E program especially, we've noticed that there are a lot of teams that do seem to detract a lot of funding, especially in the r &E program. And so each year of the 10, maybe how many are going out to brand new researcher research teams versus ones that have previously been funded. So, and not necessarily for the same project, just for that. Okay, so, so I'm just trying to think quickly of the 10 that we just funded and think how many of those are repeats and I, it's, we may not have any repeats this year in the, in the last 10, but you are right. There are some labs that seem to often get funding. And I think part of that is that they are very engaged with farmers and they know how to write the grant that meets our criteria. So they address the social, economic, and the environment, and they're engaged with farmers and they have good outreach. Um, so they, they do compete well for funding. If we are considering a grant from a team that we have not funded before and one that we haven't, and I can't think of a specific instance where we've had two that we felt were completely dead even and we went for that one. But I know that in the review, in the, in the technical review committee, which is the one that makes the recommendation about the r &E full proposals, they will often say, this is a new professor starting out. I'd like to fund him. So that's an advantage. So we do look at new, new teams and new projects. I, I, do, I see your point, though, and there are some groups that are just doing the kind of research that fits there very well, and so they do seem to get funded again and again. There are some projects at Illinois that often get uh, graduate student grants, and I think they just know know what we're looking for and know how to address that. So I don't know if that helped you at all to, to give you an idea of what, what we look for, um, but I would say that in making those decisions, we rarely, uh, it would not be an advantage necessarily to look at who the lab is coming from, and that often doesn't come up in the discussion, uh, except to say that they seem like they've got the right team of experts here. I think that's true of our other grant programs as well. And one thing I wanted to mention, because Beth, you cited the statistics for the research and education as being very competitive, but our other graduate, our other grant programs, the five other ones we have, are probably more around 30% of them getting funded on average. So. Research and education is very competitive, but keep in mind you've got just a pre-proposal for two pages, so that once you get past the pre-proposal stage, your odds are much better. They become about 30% at that point. Right. So. And I would even say, so the partnership grant program that we just started, which is much smaller, we had hoped that that would also be a place where people could start out and try some of the research projects that aren't competing well in the R&E, but, but are good projects. And I do say every year that when we turn projects away at that full proposal in our competitive program of, for r &E, we are turning down good ideas. So this past year, they, we asked them how many of these are highly fundable. So we have funding for 10. They said 25 of the 30 were highly fundable. So um, it's a tough, well, I say it's a tough situation on my end. I know it's very frustrating for researchers. And like I said, the way we've tried to address it is to minimize the amount of time you put in at the pre-proposal level anyway. Um, we've talked about setting priorities, you know, because that could uh, limit how many we get in. 
Our administrative council feels strongly that as a grassroots program, that the good ideas are coming from you and from the farmers that you're working with. And so they don't want to exclude certain topic areas by setting priorities. So right now that's, it's wide open to apply on anything. And that doesn't leave a lot of, that doesn't leave a lot of room to fund 30 good ideas, so. <laughs> that, that, that's a good way to do it. Even graduate student grants, we have had R&E grants that come in that, you know, were started by a graduate student grant and they like that as well. So, yes. So are these grant programs well known? Would a high school ag teacher uh, even know about SARE grants? So I would say, no, they're not very well known. Uh, so we'll have to give you some brochures that you could hand to them. So I always say this is the greatest little grant program you've never heard of. So um, I, I would say it's not even that well known, even among land grant universities sometime or understood that well. So we would be happy to give you some short materials. I'm sure that Andy and Laura have materials that they could give you to hand out. I will mention too, we talked about the educational materials, the bulletins that we have, like we have a bulletin on water use on your farm on cover crops. You can order those or any ag educator can order bundles of those if they're doing a workshop for free. So it could be one thing you take to an ag educator and say, you know, here's a type of bulletin that you could be using in your classroom and this is a grant program that, you know, I'd like you to collaborate on or something. We also have a nice brochure on what is sustainable agriculture that features project and, and illustrates what it is. So people have a better understanding of the practices involved. Are there any more general questions? And again, we'll be around for a while, so we're happy to answer individual questions too. So I don't know if there's more pizza back there. You can fill up on pizza. Well, thank you for attending. Yeah, we'll be here to answer some further coming. questions. Thank you.